Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you so much for being patient with us today. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your patience and we'll be getting going. Got you. All right, so welcome to the COVID-19 Coalition Town Hall hosted by the Simon Fraser Student Society and the COVID-19 Coalition. My name is Balkis. I'm an at-large representative for the Simon Fraser Student Society, or SFSS, and the I will be one of your moderators this evening. So we're pleased to have you here today, and we're looking forward to the conversation and exchange of ideas tonight. First and foremost, I would like to do a territorial acknowledgement. I realize everyone is in different places, and I invite you to consider whose land you're situated on. I want to acknowledge that my, as well as SFU's activities, take place on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, and Coquitlam nations, on which we're privileged to live, learn, work, and play. Um, unceded means that these territories have never been given over, sold, given up by these nations. Um, we are currently situated on occupied territories from the Americas to BC to SFU, we, we must be active allies when it comes to learning, challenging, dismantling um, a colonial system that settlers benefit from every day at the expense of indigenous people. So I will be your moderator along with Ali from the Teaching Support Staff Union. Hi everybody, I'm Ali. I'm a PhD student here at SFU and I'm also a uh, member of the TSSU. Uh, so I'm going to be helping moderate today and I just wanted to sort of bring us in. So the reason that why we're here today is because as students and as workers we've got together because we want to build solidarity between different folks on campus. A lot of our struggles are connected and we're stronger if we fight together. So joining the COVID-19 coalition we have a bunch of different groups that are here today and that are represented. We have, of course, the C19 Coalition. We also have the Simon Fraser Student Society, also known as the SFSS. We have the Graduate Student Society, which is the GSS. We have Tuition Freeze Now. And finally, the Teaching Support Staff Union, also known as TSSU. I know there's a lot of letters, but hopefully you can keep it all together. So basically the SFU C19 coalition is all of these groups put together and you're gonna meet a bunch of the different people from these groups over the next hour or so. So what's really important to mention before we get started is that as the coalition and as all of these groups, we are not Simon Fraser University. We're not the university. We don't have jurisdiction over SFU administration and their decisions and what they choose to do. So we're here as students and as workers of the university to come together to share, organize and mobilize because we all know that we deserve better from SFU given what we contribute and that we are the ones that make the university function. So we acknowledge that the university did host a town hall in late May. We also recognize that we did not really, the students didn't have the direct ability to respond, nor did the town hall include groups who've been ad, doing advocacy on campus. So that is why we're here today providing this platform for us to have this conversation, as well as for the university to hear from student representatives directly. So as for today's structure, we have four parts. To start off, each panelist will, will share introductions of which group they represent. Second, Ali and I will be asking questions based on, by theme, based on questions and comments that you have sent us before today on the registration form. Third part will be for panelists to answer some live questions from the audience. And lastly, we wrap up and talk about what's next in our collective efforts moving forward in building a more democratic and equitable SFU. So we encourage, we encourage you to participate today. We're gonna to do that by using this website that a lot of you are already on called slido.com. Some may be viewing from Facebook, the COVID-19 Coalition Facebook. So um, 
yeah, go ahead to slido.com and you can join this web-based application using your phone or your laptop. And go ahead and type the event code C19C Town Hall. You can participate directly with us. So let's try it out. I want everyone to pull up slido.com, enter C19C, join in answering this question on the screen. So students occupied the SFU administration building in 1968 to protest A, three consecutive years of tuition increases, B, the construction of a shell service or a gas station on campus, or C, that students transferring from SFU to SFU from BC colleges were not receiving credit for all their college courses. That should be on the right side of the slido.com C19C town hall code event. Just giving folks a second to log on, test out the questions. There is some truth to all of these options, by the way. You have to click join, go to the polls, go to the Q&A, sorry, no, the poll section, hit join, and you can go ahead and write it and answer that question. So the answer is, actually, in 1968, they protested, took over that SFU admin building to protest the fact that C, the students transferring from SFU to SFU from BC were not receiving credits for all their college courses so but the construction the protest against the construction actually did happen um also in the 60s so we are an we are a campus full of activism and a history of just speaking out so um i will pass it on to ali awesome okay glad that's working so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to have all of our panelists who are here with us introduce themselves um, and basically share with us who they are, what they do, and then update us on what their group or their organization has been doing in terms of advocacy for students or workers during or both during COVID-19. All right. So first up, I'm going to invite Allison Wick to introduce the C19 Coalition. So Allison. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Allison and I'm an undergraduate student at SFU um, where I also work as a research assistant and I'm representing the SFU C19 coalition today. Um, like Ali's saying, I'm not in charge of this organization, I'm not the head of it. I am one of many, um, many members who are also here today. I'm just representing um, the coalition today. And like Ali said, I'll be repeating some things. The coalition is, an, is really an alliance between uh, the three on-campus student groups, SFSS, GSS, and the TSSU. Um, and we're an advocacy organization, which was formed shortly after campus shutdown and classes went online and really BC as a whole went into lockdown for the coronavirus around mid to end of April. April. And the SFSS, the TSSU, and the GSS realized the significant amount of overlap and connections, especially between the struggles that their members were facing. And so we formed this coalition in order to organize, better organize for our members' collective needs. And those are really important that we're talking both on the individual level for each individual student and worker, but also us together as a whole. Um, to build our negotiating and advocacy strength to stay informed on one another's efforts and really to remain undivided as students and workers and being informed about what one another is doing is really important so that the GSS and the SFSS and the TSSU we're all fighting for a lot of the same things alongside each other so it's really important that we are doing that not individually with the university but together so that we have a lot more uh, strength and organizing power to be able to get those things done and also not allow the university to divide us. Um, we created the list of 
demands and circulated a petition which gained well over 1500 signatures of students wanting change and help from our administration. And so I'll quickly, before I end, I'll quickly talk about that um, when we talk about advocacy for our respective members and putting pressure on the university, we're really talking specifically about the university administration. So the administration is very separate from our profs and, and like our faculty and the faculty who as students were more used to uh, dealing with and kind of seeing as the university is the university and really essentially they have their own complicated government structure so government structure so if at all you're a bit confused of how it's complicated to explain <laughs> and it takes a long time to figure out which is sort of on purpose um, but they are really the ones in charge of things like our tuition in charge of financial reports throughout the school um, and those senior administration also importantly are more like politicians so their role is to listen to us and is to be accountable to us and is to make um, is to respond to our concerns um, and listen to us and work with us and then also working um, with outside sources so that's a bit about the coalition a little bit of background um, yeah Awesome, thanks so much, that was great. Okay, so next up we've got the Simon Fraser Student Society and we have Asad Mohammed, who is the president. So take it away. Thank you, Ali. And thanks everyone who has taken some time to join us. Uh, my name is Asad Mohammed, and I am currently the president of the Simon Fraser Student Society. And just for anyone who's joining us today who might not be familiar with us, uh, we represent and advocate for all 25,000 plus undergraduates at SFU. Um, we have a board of directors essentially that's made up of different students from different faculties and who take on different portfolios under the SFSS, including government advocacy, advocacy towards the university, overseeing our financial health. And essentially what we're here to do is to be there to make sure that students' rights are being respected. We're there to provide services on behalf of students. We are there to essentially make sure that students are not being, you know, left behind when it comes to finances, academics, their mental health, and all those other things that are really crucial to ensuring that students are doing well. So some of the services that we do provide include club support, we facilitate the health and dental plan for all undergraduate students, we facilitate the UPASS, and we, I don't think that our board this year had any idea that we would be walking into our new positions in the middle of a global pandemic. I don't think that any other elected student reps expected that either. But nevertheless, it uncovered a lot of gaps, I think, in the system that we have going on right now. And it's given us a lot of opportunity to find out how can we make sure that university moving forward, not just at the end of the pandemic, but essentially forever, is going to be equitable and is going to be accessible for all students. So I can highlight some of the things that we've been doing. Um, at the end of our last board year, we put forward $150,000 into a COVID-19 emergency fund. We've been loud and very, um, you know, forward with the government to let them know that we want students to have access to things like the uh, CERB that is equivalent. We know that students were allocated about $12,500 in the student emergency in the CESB or the student emergency, the Canadian Emergency Student Benefit. And we didn't think that it was appropriate to treat students like second class citizens. We put out a survey that uncovered a lot. About 50% of students almost required reported that they had experienced a heavier course load during the transition to online learning back in March. And that almost 40% of students let us know that they weren't sure if they'd even be able to enroll back in courses um, when the summer semester came around because of their financial situation. We are hoping to open up a food hub where we can actually provide fresh food to students during the course of this pandemic. And we're also working with our health plan providers to see how we can make a fair alternative for international students who may not be in the country. We're also taking a lot of consideration into UPASS and transportation as things start to open up again. And there has been a lot of student advocacy academically led by board members actually contacting instructors on behalf of students to try and get them more fair outcomes when it comes to exam vigilation and other course components as well. So a couple of things that we've been asking of the university in particular include making tuition reflect the decrease in educational quality that we've all seen. Um, you know, We've been speaking to students. I've spoken to students in my courses. I even like ran a little ad hoc poll on my Instagram story and almost 100% of students say that the quality is just not the same. We're not able to contact our profs in person. We're not able to talk with our TAs. We're not able to work with our classmates. We're isolated. 
we're doing this via Zoom or BB Collaborate where internet connection can be wacky. It can really impact the student's ab ability to learn and it has, it has for a lot of people. Uh, another big piece is that we wanted to ask for an elimination of the 2% fee when it comes to late tuition payments, simply because we think that the university needs to make more of a consideration for the financial spot that students are in. And we've also had a lot of issues regarding exam invigilation, as I mentioned earlier, in which profs are requesting that student, and I'll, I'll get more into this later. I, I know I don't have a lot of time left in my introduction, but there have been a lot of requests made to students that frankly are just a violation of their privacy, a violation of their rights and a violation of their essentially the university's commitment to act in a way that is compassionate towards students. So some of the things that we really, really want to see is we want to see student well-being put as a priority before profits, before so-called academic honesty, because at the end of the day, I think there needs to be more conversations had in good faith, not with the assumption that students are just going to cheat at any chance that they can. I think there needs to be more collaboration mm -hmm. on to how can we come up with different course components and different ways to actually test the students learning that don't include, you know, basically asking them to download spyware on their computer or asking them to do a scan of their private homes, which is so not the jurisdiction of the university or anybody else for that matter. So just to wrap it up, um, we want better financial outcomes, we want better academic outcomes, and we essentially want to make sure that our students are thriving and that their rights are being respected. And I'm hoping that through this conversation, we can find a way to make that happen. So thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Alka. that was fantastic. Okay, so next up, we're gonna have the Graduate Student Society and we have Matthew McDonald, who is the Director of External Relations for the GSS. So Matt. Hey, thanks, Ali. Um, yeah, so the GSS is, you know, did you know we have two student societies at SFU, one for undergrads and one for grads. So uh, we have a bit of a smaller population around 4,400 grad students, but we do advocacy and provide services for them, just like the SFSS does for undergraduates. And we were similarly not expecting a pandemic to hit in the middle of a semester. Um, so, you know, we've, most of our time has been set, spent dealing with this in, in two ways. So advocacy is a, a one of them and the other is providing extra financial support and services for our members. Um, so we have a pretty good working relationship with the administration in a lot of areas. Uh, we certainly disagree on a lot, but in, in terms of a lot of policy and things like that, we can at least get our voice heard. So we do spend a lot of time listening to our members and just finding out what are the issues in your various departments and programs? How do they differ, right? Are you a, a science student who needs to go back to the lab to get your thesis work done? Or are you just taking courses or you know this and that so we've worked pretty closely with graduate and postdoctoral studies on trying to solve often this boils down to individual circumstances for individual students trying to find a good solution sometimes that's not possible sometimes we have to write a letter to the administration say hey you know you need to look at this problem we're really concerned about the financial impact that this pandemic has had on graduate students in particular because most graduate students, you maybe have a bit of savings or a small loan or something, but you earn your way through university and there's very little money left over when you get your TA money or RA money or your graduate fellowship and then you pay your rent and tuition. So even a, you know, a loss of a small part-time job or an increase in fees like for transportation now that the UPASS has gone can hurt a lot. So we've been fighting pretty hard to see if the administration can help us you know, really recognize how deep these problems go and at the same time, we've also put a fair amount of money towards our own relief program, which you can apply for on the GSS website. There's a family subsidy for those with uh, dependents, either elderly care or young children. And there's also a transportation uh, bursary. And finally, there is a uh, food card, uh, emergency grocery card that you can apply for uh, if you're in need of groceries. So, uh, I think we can get into the details later in some of these questions, but that's kind of a rundown of what we do. And I guess I should also mention that if you're a grad student, your health and dental benefits come through us as well. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, health and dental. That's key. All right. So next up, we have tuition freeze now, and we're going to have Quentin Rowe Codner. So for TFN, Quentin. Yes, hi, thank you, Ali, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, so yeah, my name is Quentin and I'm presenting on behalf of Tuition Freeze Now, 
uh, since tuition freeze now is uh, organized as a non-hierarchical and direct democratic uh, student organization at SFU, uh, even though I am presenting on behalf of them, I am by no means a lead organizer or anything uh, such. Uh, so yeah, so Tuition Freeze Now is a student advocacy group uh, which aims to fight against the ever-increasing burden of tuition and fees at SFU. Our main demand to the university since our inception has been to freeze tuition increases for a period of at least two years and in that time to work together with students in lobbying the provincial government for better funding towards post-secondary education. In the past two years, we have time and again been met with an administration that is relentless in its goal of raising tuition every single school year and providing little to no support to the students that it is squeezing. Uh, in the past few months during the COVID pandemic, uh, the administration has remained consistent in its uh, with its drives of the past couple decades, providing not an ounce of financial security for students, while in fact finding new ways to, I guess, sell out students and maintain every source of revenue to as full of an extent as possible. During this time, students are already at a heightened disadvantage in a myriad of ways with regards to employment, access to government support, or even you know the day-to-day -day struggles uh, that the pandemic has presented. Despite this, SFU has chosen to turn its back on the people who should be the uh, their main concern, those who are the life of SFU, students, and of course, workers as well. While receiving inferior educations in classes with reduced standards of size and outcomes, students are still expected to pay every penny that they would in normal times. Even interest fees are still on the table for those who can't afford uh, to pay all of their tuition right away. And so as such, not only is SFU not protecting students, um, but it is actively punishing those who uh, are not wealthy enough to endure the current circumstances. And they show no signs of relenting during the coming few semesters. As the uh, pandemic uh, ensures um, at least slightly reduced expenses for the university, coupled with the ever-increasing revenue brought to them by students, SFU is treating this desperate and urgent moment uh, financially at least, as though nothing has happened, as though classes aren't all online, and as if education has not been uh, reduced in its quality. For that reason, uh, it is clear more than ever uh, that students deserve to be alleviated from the burdens and financial punishments weighed down on them by the university, and is why Tuition Freeze now supports the SFSS, the C19 Coalition, and any others committed to achieving some level of fairness at SFU. Awesome. Thanks so much, Quentin. Okay, now, last but not least, we have the Teaching Support Staff Union. And for TSSU, we have Orion Kidder, who is a longtime sessional instructor here at SFU and a TSSU member. So, Orion? Hey, uh, so as uh, one of the members of the TSSU, uh, I just wanted to explain we represent workers on campus, um, sessionals like me who are contract professors. So, we effectively have to reapply for our own job every four. Uh, of four months, um, as well as TAs and TMs, uh, and then more, most recently uh, RAs as well. So whereas student advocates represent you in terms of your uh, student needs, we represent workers. So things like uh, workload and safety and pay and support and things like this. Um, so just to give you an idea of the kind of stuff that uh, the TSSU has done in the last few years, um, we negotiated a 2% wage increase in our last contract. Um, we've actually uh, managed to instantiate some sick leave for some workers who work uh, down at uh, SFU Harbor Center. Um, we've managed to entrench academic freedom, something it's very important it means that as instructors, we can pursue the truth rather than having to be afraid that if we say certain things that we believe to be true, that they could uh, be used against us as workers. Um, we've even negotiated uh, time off for graduate students around things like um, their exams and uh, things like that. Um, so we uh, do our best to represent everybody in terms of their work life, but as that work life pertains to being academics and in many, many cases being graduate students, the bulk of our members are graduate students. Um, now, I have been an active member for quite some time. I was part of the negotiating process uh, a couple of times now. And the thing that I have learned by being in the room with the administration's negotiators is quite frankly, they don't negotiate on the basis of what is rational or what is fair. Uh, they negotiate on the basis of what produces the most revenues for the university. Um, that really is their motive. And they will spend really a lot of energy and money trying to make sure that we don't have a little more money, a few more rights that might in their minds cost them money. 
Um, so what that means is we have to put pressure on them. That's the only way to make change. They're not going to respond to reason. I hate saying it that way, but they, they just don't. That's That's been our experience. Now, in terms of what uh, the TSSU is doing right now, the conversations that I have been involved in mostly circle around workload and tech support. So when it comes to your instructors and getting a better experience out of this weird system that we're all in right now, um, teaching takes a lot more time and effort and energy when we're doing it online than when it uh, when we're doing it in the ways that we're accustomed to, that we have pre-existing habits and notes and systems for doing. I'm having to reinvent a lot of the ways that I teach right now, and that takes a lot of energy. The less energy I have as a result of that, um, the less fun the experience is and the less edifying the experience is for my students. Um, there's less contact, there's less ability to be nimble and change with uh, the needs of students who are in also really trying times. And then secondary to that workload question, which has a huge effect on students, is tech support, which all of us are struggling with right now. Now. And to be clear, the tech support people on campus are, are working as hard as they can, but there's only so many of them, and we're all dealing with systems that we're learning afresh and having things fall down on us all the time. And so that kind of technical support in things like, you know, sending me a good camera and a microphone so that students can even hear me, right? Um, all that kind of stuff really builds up. Um, we're obviously interested in other stuff to do with workers, to do with safety, to do with pay and stuff like that. But the issues I think that we're um, united on are making sure that the actual classroom experience is as positive as it can be under these circumstances. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Orion. Okay, so uh, thanks so much to everybody for all of your introductions. That was fantastic. And hopefully everybody watching, you have a little better sense of who we are. Uh, before we move on, uh, there has been a question in the Slido where you can see a list of the coalition's demands. And I just want to direct you to our website, which is pretty easy. It is SFU c19coalition.com so sfuc19coalition.com and then up at the top we have a bunch of information but including an our demands dedicated page so check out our website there's lots of stuff on there including the petition and our demands and anything that you want okay so uh we're now going to move on to the question and answer part of the town hall so the way that the next part is going to work is that we're first going to ask our panelists some um, questions that were submitted ahead of time by participants in the RSV, RSVP forms. So we've collected them. We're going to ask some of those questions first. And just to get everybody on the same page, in case people joined late, I'm just going to quickly hand it over to Valkyse to sort of remind everyone how Slido works. Thanks, Ali. So for those of us who have just joined, I'm going to show you what the participation uh, view looks like for so just enter slido.com event code c19 c town hall right here you can ask some questions and the c19 link that ali was just talking about is actually right here on the left hand side um, it just says take action so you can go ahead and click and it will direct you right towards the um, take action site all right so yeah, that is the slider reminder. Event code C19C. So moving on to this next part, we actually have some questions that every that folks have sent in. Um, these were, we kind of grouped these by theme. There were definitely a lot of stuff coming up just like related to each other basically. Um, so this was a, a pretty popular one. Our first question for our panelists, uh, we received this from a number of different participants. Why should we, undergraduates, work with the teaching support staff union? How are we even related when they're not students? Orion, could you maybe start us off with your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, as I said a moment ago, um, a huge portion of what the TSSU is concerned about is uh, sheer workload issues. Uh, and, you know, the more um, stress that I am under in terms of having to do extra work and not getting support in taking care of that extra work, the less time I have left over to 
you know, have a breezy 35, 45 minute chat with a student over video and ask them, you know, what they want their essay to be like and what they think of the play we're working on. I'm an English prof. Um, you know, the more stressed out I am, the less I can offer students uh, a really um, positive experience in classrooms. And that's something that is kind of invisible to a lot of students unless you've been in the position of being a teacher. And so, uh, you know, we see our work as uh, teachers being really in sync with what students need. We always want to be bringing what students need while accomplishing, you know, the goal of education. The less able I am, uh, I am to do that because I'm not receiving the support that I need, um, the less productive that classroom situation is going to be. So our interests and student interests are really, really in sync. We're the ones who work together. I consider my students to co-workers. Um, the people that we are having to put pressure on in order to get some of this stuff done, um, that's administration level. And um, as was mentioned earlier, you know, one of the things that as an undergrad, it's, it's hard to perceive is that your, your profs are not actually in charge of the university, especially your sessional profs. Um, we take orders and, and deliver you know, a certain kind of uh, work product in a way. Um, it, not that I conceive of it that way. As opposed to the people who are in making other kinds of really uh, money-based and organizational-based decisions. So we're on your side against the other guys. Thank you for that response. Um, very helpful um, in really understanding the link between students and um, support staff. And that a lot of our, basically when one is doing well, the other group does well, like benefits from that as well. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on this? Any panelists want to chime in? Also, what's your perspective yeah. on this? Or Allison, go ahead, Allison. I was gonna say, um, the TSSU also includes students though. So the TSSU, a large portion of the TSSU are uh, graduate students, but also our um, graduate students who are RTAs, who are tutor mark or in our TMs. Um, and they are also students um, and also includes a lot of undergrads, especially with the new um, RAs who have become unionized. I, as an undergraduate student, am a part of the TSSU. So um, not just about how we as students can work with the TSSU, but also <laughs> the TSSU has a lot of really as a labor union, really powerful organizing experience that can really, really help us as students and can give us a lot of power um, and organizing strength to be able to um, achieve the things that we want to and get the support um, and the resources that we need from the administration, from the university. Um, so that connection is uh, really important, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Any other panelists have anything to say? All right, this leads us pretty well into our next part, which has to do with um, exams and accessibility. I'll pass that off to Ali. Great, actually, I think uh, I just noted that also I've had actually wanted to answer to the last question. So maybe to change it up a little bit. Also, do you wanna just add in something? Yeah, honestly, I think Orion and Allison kind of covered what I wanted to say, but I did wanna add in that very much from an undergraduate's perspective when you've got like a TA or a TM or a sessional who is overworked and who isn't you know receiving adequate support from their higher ups it impacts our quality of education pretty severely and at the end of the day like when you're able to develop a real relationship with the folks who are instructing you that's when I think you can get the most out of your education and on top of that like Allison mentioned we could really use the support in organizing in you know banding together because at the end of the day like almost twenty six thousand students that's a lot that those are some pretty powerful numbers and we could use the expertise and the support from the tssu to make things happen and at the same time we recognize that sfu has a very top-down structure that doesn't really reflect well when like you know instructors are the first line essentially that students see when something goes wrong and they don't realize that it's actually coming from higher up and the lack of uh properly mandated support is what's actually causing the problem from higher up than just the instructors. Awesome, thanks. Um, okay, that's great. And that really does lead us into our next section. Uh, really quick though, I just wanna add a little reminder that after this portion where we have questions that we got submitted ahead of time, we are gonna be moving directly to the Slido questions. So just a reminder that if you have questions that you want people to answer that you wanna get up there, please put them in the Slido and then people can like upvote them. And that way we'll know what questions to ask people in the second half.
And hopefully you can see the screen. If you haven't already, go to slido.com and then you can just put your questions in. And then once they're in the little right hand sidebar, as you can see, you can upvote ones that you might also want to ask or that you would be interested in hearing the answers to. Okay. So let's move on to our next theme, which is a theme of affordability. And obviously this is a huge category and we got a lot of different questions for people to discuss. Um, but sort of one of the broad themes that we really wanted to discuss was sort of the quality of education at SFU post COVID. And again, please use the Slido because we're really hoping to take a lot of the information generated from you guys, the participants, and take it to John Driver, the vice president academic. As you may have seen, uh, SFU recently had their own town hall where he said that he didn't think the quality of education had gone down. And this obviously directly ties into many of the questions surrounding tuition that we're gonna dig into a little bit later. So, to get us started off here, I actually have a sort of larger list that I wanted to read out because one of the things that folks really submitted in their RSPs was their stories and they're really moving and often really sad and sort of, you just sort of feel disappointed, honestly. And I think that it's important for everyone to have this context, not just us. So I'm gonna start off with some of the comments that were submitted, which is, why are we being charged the same amount for an objectively lower quality of education? I don't find John Driver's explanation nearly satisfactory. I get that there's many other costs that the university is facing. Buildings are still needing maintenance, construction, along with dropping revenues, parking, residents, likely lower enrollment, but that burden should not be passed on to students. Next comment. Why isn't tuition being adjusted? When can we go back to real life learning? What does it mean to gain a degree through this method? Does it affect the value of the degree slash study? Next comment. Why are we still required to pay the same amount of tuition per credit despite the lower quality of course delivery? And finally, although the time to withdraw without a notation appearing on the transcript was extended, this was not the same for tuition refunds. As a student paying for tuition with their own paycheck, I feel this is not fair as it didn't account for the change of delivery of classes and the limited time frame to decide how we felt about a class in remote learning. So obviously a lot was touched on there, but and it isn't necessarily directed towards our panelists, but to get us started in a discussion, um, Matt from the GSS, Maybe, do you want to start us off by talking a little bit about affordability, quality of education, and cost? Sure. Um, I'm on? You can hear? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the student societies have been pressing the administration on tuition for a long time. And, and with the pandemic, you know, what about some sort of action on tuition? And it was really a flat no. Um, and the, the, the best place to start with why they're so firm about this is to note at one point in the not too distant past, the BC government actually provided the majority of funding to SFU and other post-secondary institutions in the province. But that funding on a per student level is really not kept up with inflation over time. So these institutions become ever more dependent on tuition revenues to operate, especially international tuition. You can graph this and the, the share of revenues from tuition just steadily creeps up in the last 20 years. And now it's uh, the majority. So, you know, this means that universities have limited, not zero, but limited room to maneuver uh, with respect to tuition without provincial action. They can do some things, they can move some things around, but a big story is at the province and students should really be concerned about what their provincial government representatives are doing on education. So a little more close to home though, uh, what happened in the pandemic? Well, the cost structure of SFU is pretty important. About 70% of SFU's expenses are related to labor and that labor is still employed as professors, TAs, support staff, et cetera. The rest is in capital projects like the ongoing construction, uh, construction and things like utilities. Um, but an unfortunate fact of this pandemic is that the bulk of students are getting less value for onle online learning, either because it's more difficult for them or they're not learning as much or they don't think it'll uh, get them as good of a job when they graduate. 
but they're getting less value, but it costs essentially the same amount of money from SFU side to produce those courses as traditional in-class learning. The difference may be, you know, a little bit of the light bill, but otherwise all the labor is still there. So this, you know, it makes it difficult. Public institutions like universities, it's, they can't really run a planned deficit and a really big tuition adjustment would be a big thing to their budget. So they're loath to do action and tuition in the best of times, let alone when they feel a lot of risk. So I will say though, there, there are two complications to this um, that matter. The, the first is that SFU has $48 million in carryovers. So carryover is basically like a, a cash balance going from one financial year to the next. Um, some of them are a little bit restricted. A lot of it's free cash. They have indicated to the student societies that this is essentially insurance for maybe uh, projections of enrollment change or something like that. They're just going to keep that $50 million uh, for safe keeping essentially. Um, but the argument we've always got is in lieu of these broad based tuition reductions to sort of match the value students are feeling they're getting from online courses with what they're paying. They're attempting to target financial aid to those who are in the greatest need. So we had that $2 million uh, emergency aid fund a few months ago. Um, and that went really fast. It was a huge demand. I mean, there's still a huge financial hole that many undergraduates and graduates find themselves in. There's clearly still a lot of need. So, you know, if they're sitting on $48 million, maybe they could release a few more million dollars, right? I mean, it's what's $45 million in insurance versus 48, right? So that's the discussion that's ongoing and we'll see what we can do there. But the, the second complication is probably even more important. You know, a lot of universities in Canada and the US may be in serious trouble in the coming year because of the pandemic. Students who are unsatisfied with online learning may not be retained students, right? They may leave, they may drop out of school, they might transfer, they might do something else. And because the universities, as I said, they do increasingly depend on tuition revenue if enough students do leave, they may be forced to make deep changes to their cost structure and re-examine tuition rates, whether or not it's convenient for them or it's easy for them. So they really, really should be thinking about how to do this already uh, and plan for the future because it might come sooner than they think. Awesome, thank you so much, Matt. That's really helpful. Um, Quentin with Tuition Freeze Now, do you maybe wanna weigh in here? Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Matt, for the other answer. and. Um, I think that everything you said was very poignant. Um, from a tuition freeze now kind of perspective, uh, I think one of the important things to note uh, with, I guess, the tuition structure currently and you know, very much so in the pandemic is that students, one of the big problems is that uh, students don't really have any say, they don't have any power, they don't really have a seat at the table um, and, or, or any transparency even as to what's happening with tuition. Um, and there's no accountability on the university as well. Um, I think since the provincial government has uh, dropped off in its share of funding towards uh, post-secondary education, uh, SFU for sure has uh, gone more and more into a model of treating SFU as a business and treating revenue as on, on more of a profit structure um, and tuition isn't something that so much happens for students but it's something that happens to students um, and we're really cut out of the picture when it comes to you know knowing anything about what's happening with tuition and while during the pandemic this is definitely uh, this reality is a heightened experience uh, for a lot of students who are made more precarious by the situation. Um, it's definitely not something that is new by any means. I mean, SFU just earlier this fall, while, you know, COVID was not something that anybody here was worried about, um, they, they were still uh, proposing to increase tuition for the coming year as they did the previous year, as they did the previous year. Uh, and time and again, uh, tuition freeze now, since we've been pressuring the university, uh, one of our main demands has just been to work with us uh, to make sure that students can at least uh, see what's happening with their tuition, to see what how, how they're costing tuition and to work with the university to lobby the provincial government, which even that they've been um, flat out against. And so I think that, uh, you know, it may be, fine and well that uh, 
you know, some of their revenues are decreased uh, from students not being on campus and that they still got some overhead costs to deal with. Um, I think one big question that we should be asking the university with regards to that is what are they doing about it? Uh, because right now the, uh, the attitude that they have is that they will just, as per usual, uh, throw this all onto students and, you know, see how we figure it out. Uh, but really they need to be working with us uh, and, you know, uh, trying to make an effort at least to, uh, to go to the provincial government to try and secure better funding and to alleviate some of the burdens that students are feeling more and more during the time. Awesome, thank you so much, Quentin. Uh, next up, I've got Allison. Yeah, I think you guys both really summed it up. Um, I wanted to add that um, with the change, that, that these are really um, explicit choices that they are making, that while they are getting less, because of um, getting less funding from the government, because um, of some particular governments we've had over the NBC over the last uh, 20 years and increasingly less funding towards uh, post-secondary education and that public education. Um, that is a choice they're making to then change their business model to become more like a business and to rely more on us. It is in part um, because of the reality of the situation that they have been put under, but it is also a choice that they have chosen to not then lobby the government. And like Quinton said, they have said no to to us as students um, to work with us to ask to get um, the government to be supporting the university in the way that it should be. Um, and also another thing that is uh, quite important to the coalition that we have talked about is transparency. So transparency both in information but also financial transparency. If they cannot lower tuition, they cannot give us tuition deferment, which T, the, the TSSU has fought and has tuition deferment for all its members. This is something that the university absolutely can very easily do is to allow students to have the whole semester to pay off their tuition, which would solve um, people withdrawing late from classes and things like that from having to pay their full tuition for a course they don't even take. Um, and so if they, if they cannot lower our tuition, sure, they cannot um, waive late fees, they cannot do all these things, they need to tell us why, and they need to be transparent about why exactly they absolutely cannot do these things, where exactly this money is going, what is their plan, like Matt said, the next two years, this is going to change how their, their funding model and how they're going to have to run the university. So uh, that's in a, with regards to tuition um, and financial situation is, um, transparency it is transparency in the choices that they are um, making yeah awesome thanks so much Allison that's awesome um, I also just want to bring everyone's attention if you haven't already we're running a poll in our slide right now around your thoughts on the quality of education if it has decreased increased or stayed the same and again we're hoping to use this as some sort of evidence to sort of let senior admin know what people might actually think. Obviously we don't have everyone here, but it's still a really important sample. So if you haven't voted already, please do. Okay, um, so that was really awesome and obviously doesn't address all of the questions on tuition that we got, but we wanted to give everyone a chance to be able to speak on it a little bit. Uh, so continuing on the theme of affordability, we did get a bunch of questions about the UPASS. And this is sort of a question that's specific to the student societies. But the question that we got is that a lot of people still need access to the UPASS to get to work or to do basic needs, basic day-to-day -day stuff. So what are you folks, the student societies, doing about the UPASS? Will we have it in the fall? So let's start off with also the president of the SMSS. Thanks, Ali. And, you know, the UPASS for us has kind of become a moving target as different restrictions lift and people are essentially able to travel more freely. Something that we noticed in the summer was that there wasn't a lot of demand, or at least in the early summer, there wasn't much demand on uh, from undergraduate students to reinstate the UPASS. Of course, there was students who still needed support and getting around and um, were not thrilled by the decision. But it was a pretty quick decision that we had to make at the end of our last board term. And in the end, a majority of students did want us to suspend the UPASS for the summer semester, which is the agreement that we did sign. But now as we're seeing restrictions lift, we're starting to wonder what, uh, essentially what are students needing right now? What demand is there for the UPASS? And 
at the same time, it's a bit of a tricky situation because we have to essentially align our asks with the graduate students who have a very different uh, situation than we do. And I'll let Matt speak on that one. But our VP external, Samad Reza, has been working a lot with different student societies on the issue of UPASS. And a big piece of it is that we want to be able to accommodate students as best as they can for the folks who are staying at home. We want to see is there a way that we can let them stay at home and not have to pay the additional 160 some dollars that they have to pay per semester. And for the folks who do need to get around, how can we support them in getting around and how can we make sure that they are able to get to their jobs and able to get to the different places that they need to be. So as of right now, what I can say is that there is some advocacy happening on our behalf to essentially make more accommodations for students when it comes to UPAS. As of right now, our agreement to suspend the UPAS is going to end in August, and I don't, it's going to end in August, so we're going to, I'm going to follow up with Samad, and we'll make sure to make sure that undergraduates are aware of whatever the outcome is, is of our lobbying, whatever the outcome is of our, essentially, our next steps. But as of right now, UPASS continues to be suspended, but we are very, very cognizant of the fact that things are changing and that we are trying to adapt to make sure that we are working in that direction, in the directions that the students want us to go. So we've got our ear in the ground. We've got a survey coming out soon, hopefully, regarding UPASS to get a more specific or a more accurate view of what students are feeling right now and what their demands are. And we're going to use those results to actually guide our, our advocacy efforts for UPASS um, in the coming future. Awesome, thanks. Uh, that's super helpful. Okay, so I guess from the Graduate Student Society's perspective, Matt, can you offer us maybe a little more context? Yeah, I can. So actually, I gave an interview to the Peak, the student newspaper at SFU. It's called, there's a story out called Grad Students Grapple with Lack of UPASS as Labs Reopen. So people can find that on their website. Um, and it's a little bit more lengthy than what I'll be able to give you right now. But the basic story is there, there kind of is a big split between graduates and undergraduates, um, especially in a commuter campus like SFU where many graduate students have physical laboratory research and, and things like that, that they have to go back to campus to do. And it's starting in June actually. Um, and a lot of grad students have families and kids. There just seems to be a kind of higher ambient demand uh, for transportation, um, even despite the pandemic. So we've got a lot of emails at the GSS. Grad students, you know, why did it go away? When is it coming back? You know, I really need this. Um, and the reason is it's a collective program. There's 16 post-secondary institutions and student societies that participate in it. The GSS here was the last one to vote and we really didn't have a choice at that point. Uh, everyone else had voted to suspend. So we didn't want to, but we didn't, that's the way it was. Everyone, it was kind of an all or nothing deal for everyone. So at the same time, um, you know, it's still a little up in the air, as Asa was talking about for the fall, the, the suspension technically lasts till August, but there are so many open questions about what's going to go on. So a lot of the advocacy efforts we have been doing um, directed at the provincial government in, in uh, conjunction with the UPASS advisory committee, which is representatives from all the participating institutions and societies is, you know, maybe we can get a curve in for grad students. Like UBC grads are interested in this. And there's a, I think BCIT as well, a technical school, they really like it. So there might be some sort of tailored uh, situation for different uh, student societies or institutions. There may be an opt-in. That's something we're looking at. I don't know if that'll happen, but I really hope something comes back for September because the demand is only gonna go up and even for many undergraduates. Uh, so the last thing, I did mention this earlier, but we do give a, for the summer, there's a transportation bursary available at the GSS. That is, you apply for whatever zone pass you need. If it's for research, i.e. you need to go back to campus. So there's like a, basically a, a slip that you need your supervisor to sign off on. Um, and SFU has actually graciously uh, agreed to help fund that um, through student services and, G and graduate and postdoctoral studies. So we should have enough funding to last through the summer if you need a transportation bursary and you're in need, um, which is the good news. But we're working very, very hard to make sure that there's a solution for grads in the fall and onward. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. That's also really helpful. Okay, so we're going to move on to another question uh, before we get to the Slido questions, but we've just opened a new poll in the Slido for you guys to answer. Uh, so please head over there. Uh, we're asking the question, in what areas do you need SFU to support you more in the transition to remote learning? So go ahead and put whatever you want, whatever you think, whatever you need in the Slido so that we can know and we can pass that info on. 
Okay, so our next question for panelists is one that's a little bit broader, but I think is still really interesting. And this came from one of our participants. And this is the question. Do you feel that students could have done more to be proactive in their own adjustments to remote learning? And to get us started, I'm going to throw this over to Orion. Sure. Um, on an individual level, I, I, I can't imagine. Y'all are already working your butts off, um, trying to keep up with a really genuinely seriously difficult situation. Um, I've got students who have kids at home who can't go anywhere because they have nowhere to go because parks were closed, because schools were closed. I have people in essential services. Um, my students uh, are doing everything they possibly can on an individual level. So, I mean, the idea that this somehow falls on students, is just, that's, that's just backwards thinking. Um, these kinds of burdens should fall on the giant multi-billion dollar institution, right? That's the one that has the facilities to do big things through policy changes. Now, in terms of um, all of us organizing collectively, sure, that's something we um, are doing right now. That's what this whole conversation is about. Collective organization is what we can do to put pressure onto an institution so that it can do things with all of the money and the power that it has to to lighten the burden on all of us. Um, yeah, the idea that this is the responsibility of indiv individual students is, I have the word for that is neoliberalism. Thanks. Awesome, <laughs> thanks, Orion, that's great. Um, okay, so next up we've got also with the SFSS. Yeah, thanks, Allison, or Ali, my bad. Um, I just wanted to say that I think by putting the onus on the students to essentially be proactive to something that none of us saw coming is a really, I think it's a way to divide us and to essentially make students think, you know, okay, this was my own fault. I'm not able to keep up with my class and stuff. When in reality, it's really, really common among students right now to be struggling in their academics to a level that they have never struggled before. And being in university already is really, really tough. Being an undergraduate already is incredibly tough. It is four or five, six years of your life where you are dedicating yourself to a program that can be fun at sometimes but other times is incredibly difficult and a lot of our students already deal with the difficult home lives or having to work a lot or having uh, financial situations that aren't great or being thousands and thousands of miles away from their family and their support system so to throw this in and then to say that you know it students should have been more proactive I think a better way to look at it might be like how could the university have had structures in place that would have prevented this disaster to begin with how could we have been supported in a way that you know we're not getting results in our survey saying that students mental health are on an incredible decline where students are not having safe spaces to work and to study and to do what they need to do to essentially just stay alive so I really really think that when we can kind of get over this idea that you know it's each individual person's fault that something is going wrong and that we can actually realize okay maybe there's a bigger structure at play that is not actually working for us and that we need to make some deeper and more long-lasting changes that we can actually make those changes and we can make things happen so uh, i think at the end of the day we need to treat students and each other with compassion because this is a really difficult time we're going through Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Does any of our other panelists have anything they want to add to this? Um, if not, we're going to just shift slightly to working from the Slido questions that participants have been adding. I see nothing. And thus, I'm going to hand it over to Val Keys to introduce us to the Slido. For sure. So I don't, um, as Ali mentioned earlier, we're actually running another uh, poll to just give us your input. Um, it is, this one is in the form of a word cloud. So just in what areas do you need SFU to support you more in the transition to remote learning? And you type, I think you have up to 25 characters. So yeah, just type away, let us know what your responses are and we'll share those as well. So let's start off our live questions with the most top top one, most popular. Let's see. Yay, I love that the list of coalition demands has the most thumbs up. <laughs> but after that, um, 
Okay, this one's a pretty general one. What are the coalition's main concerns going into the fall 2020 and spring 21, 2021 semesters? I know we've touched on this a bit, but um, I can hand this off starting with Ali. Allison, sorry. We have um, two Allies. <laughs> I did change my name just for the day. Um, so, I mean, one of our main concerns is that this isn't really both that there are going to be some huge changes and also that there that this is not going to change, that this is not going to go away. This isn't something that's for the interim, kind of an awkward one or two semesters, but this is going to have some major, major impacts on the next um, two, at least uh, one to two years. Uh, in the university of our degrees of our learning uh, of our working lives um, but also then like we've talked about before uh, talking about uh, finances and funding is going to have major um, implications for just the future of the university itself and the way that the, the university is run so uh, one of our most i'm just looking at the question our, yeah our main concerns uh, is that this is not going away um, and organizing wise, uh, building strength and really building power and building solidarity as a group is really, really important um, to not get caught up really in the difficulties of the situation. Um, one thing that we're seeing uh, happening is that there are things that are available as, as resources to people, but it's all on the individual level. It's all about individual students applying for something hoping they're going to get this aid. That's the same thing that the federal government is doing um, with CERB and says, I mean, who hasn't been on the phone for more than like for at least four hours with like applying and having difficulties with CERB and says. So these programs, but talking about the university that are um, very individualized um, is, yeah, it just puts a lot of onus on the students. So that's a concern of ours um, is asking the university to stop to not have students individually apply for um, tuition, special uh, tuition exceptions, or to individually apply for um, degree timeline extensions, but to just open that up to everyone and, and make those things um, uh, make those things policy and just available to everyone that people don't have to worry whether or not they'll be able to apply uh, and will receive those things. Um, and then of course, another one of our concerns um, is, I mean, we want to work with the university. We don't, um, it's much more productive if we don't have to fight them. So an important a major concern of ours is being uh, listened to and really having uh, that transparency of information and of finances that we can actually have productive conversations uh, and meetings with the administration um, where we can both move forward, I think. Yeah, I know Orion has some things to add, so I can pass it on to him. But those are our main uh, concerns for for right now is that information, um, that things are not going to go away. So we need to stay on top of how things are changing, what things are not changing, and the way that um, things that are supposed to help us are actually in many ways um, dividing us and further isolating us. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Allison. All right, Orion. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, I mean, on this issue of having to apply individually, um, this is a really common uh, institutional tactic, quite frankly. If you think about the inefficiency of it, right, each individual student has to fill out some kind of individual form. That individual form has to be evaluated by somebody in uh, the bureaucracy. This all costs a huge amount of time and therefore money for the institution, rather than making one big uh, policy change that sweepingly helps a whole bunch of people. Um, it is often used as a way to keep people from accessing the support that they're looking for, rather than an efficient way of giving it out. You know, when the Canadian government uh, put together CERB, they specifically just said, look, here, here it is, everybody, everybody just take it, right? We'll figure it out later. Um, that's a better move than saying, hey, could you fill out this form in triplicate, please, and it'll take us six weeks to get back to you. Um, so I have objections to that kind of, we'll only solve your individual problem stuff. That is a way of keeping people from accessing what they need. Thanks, yeah, that's really important. Okay, 
so let's, we have a lot of questions to get through. So we're going to be a little rapid fire here. Um, so our next question is one that's a little more specific and perhaps our student societies can help us out with this one. So we've got, what if my professor makes a decision that makes me uncomfortable or doesn't take my need for accommodation seriously? Who can I escalate those concerns to? And also why don't you start us off? Yeah, for sure. And this is a situation that we are becoming increasingly familiar with. Um, we have had everything from profs essentially spraying on students that they're going to be invigilated by Zoom or BB collaborate to profs essentially just refusing to respond to students, to profs refusing to make exam accommodations for students, to just all sorts of things that never would have been an issue without online learning being in place. And I know that essentially what we recommended students to do is if you don't feel comfortable responding and you fear any kind of retaliation, please reach out to us. We can try to reach out to the prof on your behalf. Essentially what we do is reach out to the prof and if it doesn't go anywhere to the their supervisor. So whoever would be, it would be, it could be like the undergraduates program manager. I don't know if that's a specific term, but someone of that caliber and then take it up to the Dean if it doesn't really um, get resolved there. And Unfortunately, uh, a lot of that still goes unresolved. And of course, the ombudsperson is a great resource to students, but their job is to essentially be a policy advisor to students and they cannot actually take any action on behalf of a student, which is understandable as that is part of their job. But something that we want to see is essentially something that we are going to be putting in place at this September is a student advocate hired by the SFSS, similar to one that the GSS has, someone who can actually be there to respond to concerns from students and someone who can actually act as on the student's behalf in a very partial manner because it will be fully funded by the student society who can help to address some of these concerns. But essentially, we know it's really rough. We wanna help you email me, email the board if you have a problem and we will really do our best to help you out. Awesome, all right, and we've got Matt from the GSS next. Yeah, so for grad students, the process is fairly standard, but of course it does sort of depend on what exactly um, kind of like the professor did or said, or what kind of flexibility you're looking for. So if it's minor things, sometimes it just goes through your graduate program assistant, like technical issues or something like that. Um, if it's more with the professor, often the department chair is your first step. And if it's not resolved there, sometimes it can go to the dean. Uh, but if it's much more sensitive, uh, as also kind of mentioned, the GSS has our advocate and policy advisor, Harjap, has an office. You can send an email. This is a confidential process. And the university also has its ombud person whose job is to make sure that the rules were properly applied to each student's case, which often they aren't. So the ombuds person can help in that case when the rules weren't applied. So that is generally the, the sort of escalation. Um, often people do go to our advocacy office when it's something particularly sensitive or they feel like they might face retaliation within the department, which has happened on occasion. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Thank you both. That's really helpful. Okay, so our next question is a bit of a bigger one. Um, so bear with me, it's a little longer. What can smaller student unions, i.e. faculty student unions, do to help the cause for better learning conditions for the students we represent? And related to that, can slash should faculty student unions, i.e. SASS, collaborate with these larger organizations to help support undergrad students. And I think we've got Orion first. Yeah, um, uh, so I was involved in this kind of organizing with the TSSU all the time. And it was always great when a local group had already organized itself, they'd already gotten each other's phone numbers and email addresses, they'd already organized as a group so that they could respond. And then suddenly you have 25 people all coming to an event and helping with it um, and putting pressure on the institution rather than having to individually um, grab all those individual people. So if you've got your small group that you're working with and you're all in sync with each other about what your needs are and what organizations you want to support, um, that means you can contact us as a group. Uh, and then suddenly, bam, that's a whole bunch of people who are all um, uh, together on something. So absolutely organize on the local level so that you can then do stuff for the bigger uh, organizations. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan. So anyone else with comments on this question? All right, we have one that is um, 
a good question. It's why does this coalition view itself as a separate entity from SFU? We are SFU. I see Orion, go ahead. Yeah, this comes up in TSSU discussions all the time. Um, definitely, we are SFU. Uh, we are the largest number of people who are SFU, the TSSU, the SFSS, the GSS. Um, where we uh, have to draw lines, unfortunately, because as was said before, we don't necessarily get cooperation, uh, is from a, uh, an executive layer of administration at the top of the organization, the people with the most power to make certain kinds of decisions. Um, I would argue we are SFU, they're the admin. And unfortunately, we often have to convince the admin to do what is not even just right, but just like rational. So I, we're not separating ourselves from the university. We're identifying where power lies at the university. And it's with that executive layer at the top. Amazing. Thanks, Orion. And we've also got Allison on this. Um, well, I'd answer that question. Um, you would ask, what, well, what do we consider SFU? Yeah, we are SFU. So then why don't we get to make these decisions? Why do we not have input on where our money goes? Why do we not know where our money goes? Why do we not have, like, there are so many things that if, if okay, if we're saying that we are SFU, then we should have all these things. So because we do not have the ability to do, um, to really have so much input in our education, in our schooling, in how our school is run and who runs our school, we there there is a major power imbalance there and that's what we're really talking about is that power imbalance that we are not the administration while we are the sfu community while we do run the school as students while we do literally fund this school as students we are not the administration because we do not have the power the, the power of the administration we do have much more power and more um matched power as a group and as a collective and which is why we form this coalition because as individuals we do not have that power and that's really what we're asking for is we're asking as the SFU community to be treated like the SFU community and to be given um, and basically to be let into those circles where those decisions are made and to be given actual uh, input and be, to be listened to in that way. All right and next up I've got also. Yeah thank you and I, I just I know I'll Allison kind of touched on this one already, but when you realize the sheer number of people that we have within the different groups that have kind of already banded together to some extent, when it comes to undergraduate students, plus all the graduate students, plus all the TASTM sessionals, plus all the other community members who have been impacted, there is a lot of power in numbers, like just the sheer amount of people at SFU very, very much outweighs the folks who are at the top and making the decisions from you know, a place that is far removed from what the actual experience of a student or a worker is at SFU. And I think that this provides an opportunity for us to realize that now is the time that we can actually build power with the numbers that we have. And when it comes down to it, you can't say no to 35,000 plus people. You have to take our asks into uh, consideration. You have to make sure to consider them fairly. And at the end of the day, it can happen. It just needs us to organize it. It needs us to recognize that we do have a similar goal. So this is not just a call out to, you know, the faculty department student unions who have been super helpful and great and who can help us in this fight. But this is to every single student who's here watching, who's not here watching, any workers at SFU who think that they're being treated unfairly, like now is our chance. I think that this is a good opportunity to stir some things up. Awesome, thank you all so much. Okay, the next one's a little more technical. Um, so has the university made considerations for tuition payment installments for the fall semester and or foregoing the interest for late tuition payments? And we've got Matt first. Yeah, to my knowledge, they have not publicly disclosed anything like that, although I wouldn't be surprised if they were thinking about doing the same thing they did over the summer. That being said, I have not heard. I will ask about that in my next meetings and hopefully we can find out. Um, I mean, this was somewhat controversial in the summer because they, a lot of students viewed this thing as, okay, we're going to give you something, which is a payment plan. So you can basically register for courses, uh, you know, next semester, but then, uh, or sorry, without having to pay your tuition upfront, right? Because normally that's the thing until you're paid up, you can't register. 
so that was good. But then also there's a penalty, a financial penalty, a relatively small one, but still a penalty. And a lot of students got the feeling like, hey, you're giving us something, and then you're taking something else away. You can't give us a break, right? Um, so, I mean, the argument there was really about cash flow and continuity, which is odd. As I mentioned earlier, they do have $48 million in carryovers, which would presumably cover the late fee payments. And additionally, you can't walk away on this debt very easily because then you can't finish your schooling. You have to give up your whole degree. There's a big penalty to not paying your tuition, right? So that's kind of built in that people aren't going to default at very high rates. But in any case, uh, they will. I wouldn't be surprised if they do something similar uh, for next semester. So we'll see. I'll try to find out as soon as I can. Thanks, Matt. Next up, Quentin. Uh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, from a technical standpoint, I don't have much to add from that. Um, I also am unaware of uh, anything that they're uh, planning on doing with regards to tuition in the upcoming semester. Uh, however, that's definitely a concern. And again, I don't really see any reason, uh, at least for them, in terms of what their interests are financially, why they would um, you know, relent or give students a little bit of a break unless we demand it from them in some collective capacity. Um, because I mean, like I've said with tuition freeze over the past two years, uh, it's been brick wall after brick wall. And for the past couple decades, every single year they've been committed to uh, not even just uh, keeping tuition at a flat rate uh, through and through, but to increase tuition uh, and to increase the burden that students are feeling. And I mean, I don't see any reason besides a, a moral one uh, that they would decide otherwise for the upcoming uh, year and semester, uh, which is why I think that it's very good that we are sitting down and talking right now uh, in July um, so that we can you know, make a plan to move forward and to demand that they take student priorities with tuition into consideration. Awesome, thank you guys. Okay, unfortunately we have way too many questions. So we only have time for, I think like one or two more, um, but I'm gonna try to go with the upvoted ones that I'm getting sent. Um, so the next one is, how can we support our sessional instructors as undergraduate students since we're in this together? And I think I'll throw this over to Orion first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the administration kind of counts on sessionals, excuse me, on students not um, knowing what the issues are with sessionals uh, specifically and uh, not being supportive of them. So A, let the administration know that you absolutely support us, that we're your teachers and that you want us to have the support so that we can do a good job at teaching you. Email driver at sfu.ca. Send him a message directly saying, no, absolutely. I know what sessionals are going through and I absolutely support them. Now, the second thing you could do is tell your parents to email driver at sfu.ca. They hate hearing from parents because they know parents control money and their biggest concern is revenue stream. So make it known that people off campus know what's up and know that the conditions that we work under are very often really deplorable. That embarrasses them, that shames them, that makes them fear for their revenues. Do that stuff, please. That would be awesome. Amazing. Yeah, we definitely need to get behind our sessionals. Okay, I think we're going to do one more big one and then a little one. Um, so what are the ongoing and upcoming financial support plans for international students, both undergraduate and graduate? as the COVID-19 situation continues. And I haven't really had a chance to let our speakers list evolve, but maybe I'll throw this over to Osab first. Uh, thank you, and that is a really good question. We have noticed an increased burden on international students, not only during the pandemic, but even ahead of time. A lot of things that we've been addressing include the international student health fee. That's something that we have been actively lobbying the government to eliminate. We recognize that this is, it was bad before, but even worse now when you consider the actual financial burden that's gone up. So a lot of folks may not be able to get financial support from pretty much anyone if you're not able to work. Uh, international students do have a limit on how many hours they work unless it's in an essential job, which to me honestly just seems like kind of put yourself in danger in some ways or you know forfeit your income. But at the same time, we want to alleviate that financial burden and also not have to force students to put themselves in precarious positions to make a living. 
Another thing that we've been advocating for is a cap on international student tuition fees. As of right now, there is no cap in BC. It is essentially up to the university as to how much they want to increase international student fees. And in previous years, it has been by a lot, uh, up to 20% in some, some different departments and in some cases. So we would like to see a re reflection of, I guess, good faith from the provincial government by capping it at 2% the same way that they do for uh, domestic students. And essentially to recognize that international students are valued members of our communities and they're not just here to pad their wallets. Um, it's something that we're working on and we'll continue to work on. We recognize that it is a big fight, but yeah, we're, we're working on it. Awesome. Um, do any of our other panelists want to jump in on the question of international students and financial support? Yeah, I can briefly. I mean, Asap said a lot about it. Um, one of the complications with graduate students is the fact that a lot of international students aren't necessarily in Canada right now or having travel difficulties and their employment at SFU and thus their income that supports them attending SFU is tied to RA or TA duties. Uh, and there are issues like around visas and paying them and insurance and all of this sort of thing that need to be worked out and worked out quickly. Um, so I, I know the administration and, and GPS are looking at that, but it's a tough problem. And the, the GSS, the Grad Society, we're, we're doing everything we can too to find out what kind of unique situations students are in all over the world uh, and how we can make it that they can still get money, they can still go to school. Um, and yeah, just... What Asif said at the end is important that it's been really tacitly understood by universities all over BC for many years that what they're going to do is raise the price of international tuition more and more as a sort of subsidy that the government won't provide for the rest of the university, right? The government's saying, we'd like to give you more money, but how about you just get it out of international students instead of us giving it to you? And that way we don't have to raise taxes. That is pretty much explicitly with every top university administrator in BC understands very clearly. And I think it's a problem. It's one thing to pay your fair share or whatever that means, right? But university, international students are paying for their own education and then so, part of someone else's, right? So I, I don't think that's very fair. And especially the sort of deep financial problems that this pandemic has exposed, it's become a bigger and bigger issue. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, next up, we've got Allison. I was just uh, going to add while we're talking about this that um, part of the uh, beginnings of why the, the coalition was um, formed and created was especially to fight for um, international students and to really have um, international students and marginalized students at the core um, of who we were fighting for. Because um, like Matt said, it, it's, it's really beyond unfair. Um, and uh, yeah, and so just that the coalition, um, it's very important um, international students not be left behind by the university um, since they have been funding the university that now um, that they're unable to fund the university that they're essentially being told that um, there's nothing for them here, which is um, offensive and ridiculous. Um, yeah. Awesome, thanks. Unfortunately, we have to lose Orion, one of our wonderful panelists. He has children, real life children that he needs, you know, that need taken care of. So I oh, just wanted children. to say <laughs> a quick thank you to Orion for being with us and, you know, being here later than expected. So thanks so much. I thank all of you who are watching. Thanks everyone for being on the panel. This is a really important discussion and I'm sorry I can't stay for the rest of it. Bye everyone. Awesome. Bye Orion. Okay, but I did uh, just remember or find out because I had the time wrong that we're going to go till 630. So we actually have time for a few more questions, not too many, but we've got a really big important one next, which is what is SFU's current stance on using exam invigilation software? What are C19C's thoughts on this topic? And to start us off, I'm going to throw it to Elsa. Yeah, thank you. And I can share what I know, so please bear with me because it's a little convoluted and difficult to, to understand. But back in May, uh, essentially, it was told by the VP Learning and Teaching, Dr. L, that if instructors wanted to use 
essentially invigilation software or any kind of online invigilation that they had to let students know in the first week of classes, it had to be on their syllabus and that if students did not want to do it, that they had to have proper accommodations put in place. And this was essentially just to make sure that if students were told, okay, you have to use a software or you have to use Zoom or BB Collaborate or whatever, that you would have a chance to essentially withdraw from the course and that you could essentially go your merry way. Um, there was no distinction made in that email, if I'm not mistaken, between um, like something like Proctorio, which is uh, essentially will spy on you from your computer, um, between like something like BB Collaborate or Zoom. So we understood that and we got a lot of emails from students who are unfortunately being told very last minute that they were going to be using these softwares and we kind of took those on as a by case by case basis and by we I mean myself and other board members who are essentially communicating with profs to try and clarify the issue. Um, but, you know, in the end, and I, I know that there have been a lot of issues with Proctorio and um, students have brought issue to us about having to do like room scans or profs asking them to like you know do oral pieces of an exam if they felt that they were cheating and then very recently only within the last couple of weeks we learned that the university has now decided to make a distinction between what is considered invigilation software like Proctorio and something like Zoom or BB Collaborate. And now profs are being told that you're allowed to ask your students to use Zoom or BB Collaborate for exam invigilation. You did not have to tell them ahead of time. And in a setting meeting yesterday, um, Dr. Driver actually let us know that the university does not have any guidelines as to what profs have to tell their students or in terms of exam invigilation tactics. I don't think that's fair, especially considering that we're at home kind of waiting and we're not, I, I, you don't really need to know about in exam invigilation tactics when you're in person because you sat down in a class and you wrote your exam. Things are very, very different now. So I would say my stance against exam invigilation is that you don't, no one has the right to enter your home without your permission. No one has the right to see what's on your computer without your permission. And for something as controversial as Proctorio, it doesn't even make sense to suggest that to anyone. I would say that for the most part, we have been pushing against this and we would like to work with the university to find different ways of actually assessing students learning that don't include violating their privacy. And we've made it very clear that we're happy to work with on them with that. We are very, very happy to do what we can to make it happen. We just need a commitment from the university that they will do that instead of going ahead and piloting things like who knows what Proctorio, other software that could be even worse. Awesome, thanks so much, Asa. Uh, next, Matt. Yeah, I just have a few quick things to add. And on the topic of Proctorio, I saw on social media that the CEO went on Reddit and posted a chat transcript with a student who had questions about it. So, you know, maybe your privacy is not safe in more ways than one in that case. Um, but yeah, we've heard a lot from students, uh, even with Canvas, exams run on Canvas. There's been a lot of weird glitches and errors. Late exam starts the sort of, I think someone in Slido had a question about the sort of linear process of it. You can't easily go back to another question or sometimes profs give it to you in segments. Like you have 10 minutes to do this question and then it's, you can't go back to it. It's done forever. Right. So there's a lot of difficulties and problems people or students are having with all this sort of individualization software and none of it's standardized profs, as you said, could do whatever they wanted. So I think this is being taken up in the Senate. Um, and anyone who's listening and they have concerns about this, it would be good to message student senators. Just email them, say, hey, you know, I'm concerned about this. Can you take this up in the Senate? Can you see what's being done? Can you, you know, lobby for more standards, more guidelines that are enforceable, right? And not just hope the situation sorts itself out, out on its own because I don't think that's happening. It's midway through the summer, right? We're still hearing about it. Great, and I'm actually gonna hand it over to Valkyse, our other moderator, to ask a follow-up question. Yeah, so we're seeing some questions about um, just general deadlines. Um, can we have more flexibility with grading and deadlines? Uh, overall theme is accessibility and equitable learning. Um, we just started a poll right now. Do you think SFU, SF, just SFU as an institution, is doing enough to mandate equitable and accessible learning. Um, I guess based on, if you haven't touched on this already, I guess I would just like to ask the panelists any thoughts and comments on that. Is SFU doing enough to mandate equitable and accessible learning? And what can, you can touch on advocacy that you have done that you haven't mentioned so far 
or um, ideas for just future. <laughs> what can we do? Um, would anyone like to start us off? Great, I've got Allison on the speakers list. Um, yeah, I can talk about this just quickly. Um, as far as what, um, I mean, of course, we don't really think SFU is doing um, enough, but specifically, um, what we don't think is fair in the way that they're attempting to do this is that um, in the emails that they've sent to uh, faculty and to staff that I have received, um, they've essentially left it entirely up to um, professors really to be um, dealing with this and figuring things out. And there's a question before about what if the professor is not taking me seriously or my concerns about um, like accessible learning or just, um, simple questions about changing um, aspects of the course and how you're taking the course. Um, it's the university has said that profs individually need to just be as flexible as they can and try to work out things on an individual student by student basis, which is number one, very unfair to the prof. That's a lot of work for them to do. That's a lot of um, messaging back and forth that they need to do when they have many other students that they also need to be figuring individual things out. Um, that's unfair to the student to be putting them in that in that very precarious situation. Um, a lot of uh, the question also um, talked about feeling uncomfortable, um, your prof making you feel uncomfortable because you, as an individual, um, you just don't have the same amount of power. You're the one taking the course. Um, and essentially, if it's left up to the prof, you either have to do what they say or you'll have to drop the course. Um, and that's an incredibly, incredibly unfair uh, burden to place on students and to place on profs because that puts way too much make way too much risk for profs to make um, errors on their own, um, way too much pressure on students to have to deal with these things on their own. So basically that's a long way of saying that um, it's the same issue of um, leaving things up to the individual that the university and the administration will not legislate that profs need to do things in this way or that way, but just that profs need to figure it out themselves and figure it out for their classes themselves and figure it out with their students themselves. And that is something that we really have um, taken issue with. And is that is something that um, we're, we're asking to make for them to make real actual decisions rather just than more, rather than just, um, decisions of ambiguity that just leave it all up to uh, individuals. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ali. That's great. Okay. Our next question is a bit of a difficult one, especially because it's quite personal. So the question is, I can't afford to take online lab courses as they are not viewed as comparable to in-person. Should I delay my education until in-person teaching can resume? And Quentin is going to start us off on this. Uh, yeah, so that's a very uh, tough question, just in, as Ali mentioned, how personal it is. And uh, I'm I, very sorry to anybody who is uh, experiencing that right now and those tough decisions. But I think that it is one of those considerations that is uh, definitely heightened uh, during the pandemic. And for a lot of students, even just students who maybe uh, were set to enroll for the first time as a first year come the fall, um, students who rely on employment to uh, pay tuition who are finding that to be more precarious. I think that that's a huge concern for a lot of students right now. And so for your uh, question, I think that, I mean, it's, uh, if 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 you think that it's 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 worth it to be able to, to do that, um, then I would say go for it. But again, that's that's very much on a case by case basis. And hopefully, this whole situation ends by spring, and the following year everything is back to normal. Um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully even by fall, SFU can have a little bit more uh, structured uh, in terms of providing financial security to students. Um, but as of right now, the only thing that we can do to try and uh, make that happen is to, you know, collectively come together and demand that the university treat this situation with a lot more urgency um, than they have been doing so far. 
Um, so again, you know, I, I, I hope that everything works out for, uh, for uh, the, the asker of the question. And I mean, for, for all students going through something like this right now. Yeah. Thanks so much, Quentin. And we've got Matt. Yeah, I think this kind of depends on if you're in a graduate program, uh, if you're an undergraduate program, and if you're early or late undergraduate, right? So if you're in your first or second year, you may be able to put off lab courses and rearrange your schedule uh, to a later year, maybe your final years, and that might be the best way to go. Um, but you have to keep in mind, I mean, we're looking at the United States right now, like just ridiculous levels of COVID-19, and it just escalated very suddenly. And we happen to share a big old border and a lot of flights coming back and forth between the two countries. So, you know, until there's some sort of vaccine or cure or, you know, long-term decline in the amount of cases in around Canada, the United States and Europe, this thing could be going on for a while, you know, maybe a year, maybe even more potentially, right? So it's a big risk to put off necessary courses like labs indefinitely, right? You might be able to, and if you're a grad student, it's very difficult. Either you could take a leave of absence for a semester, but it's, you know, it may be that you just have to do that. And a lot of grad labs will probably be in person, the really necessary ones, but it's kind of the trade-off, right? It's, it's, I don't, I wouldn't depend on the pandemic going away by the spring or the summer or the fall, like Quentin mentioned, right? It could be around for a while. So I think the best thing to do is look at your schedule and see what you can move around and push off. Um, but there may be a time where you just have to say, you know what, it isn't as good and I'm not learning as much online compared to an in-person lab with that hands-on physical experience, but it has to be done. Hopefully you'll make it up at the end of your degree in, in some time. And I think also most employers are going to have to just take this into account that there's a whole year or two of students who didn't really necessarily have the same experiences as everyone else did, but you can't just not hire to like a whole cohort of people. Right. So I, I think there will be adjustments made hopefully, and maybe more training and things like that as you go through life to, or get a new job. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. We're quickly running out of time, unfortunately. So I'm going to give Allison the last comment on this. I just wanted to quickly reiterate um, in response to this question that this is an injustice. This is unfair. Someone has to choose um, between going into greater debt, um, between for international students, between losing their status, uh, being at risk of losing their status if they do not take courses um, and not being able to pay their rent and not being able to eat. That is not something that an individual student um, should have to decide. That's not something that there should, that should fall on their shoulders. Um, and I think we really think that this will keep happening and no one should have to decide to leave their education um, because of these external factors that the university is not helping us with. Um, and so something like a collective disenrollment like that or a strike is how we can politicize and do something about this injustice because this is, this is not fair um, and it's ridiculous that students would have to make that decision on their own and that this would be something that the university can just say that's tough we can't do anything about it because they can do anything do something about it and we know that they can and that's why we form this coalition is because we know that they can do more and they're not doing more amazing powerful words thank you so much allison okay unfortunately we only got time for one more question but it's a big one it's actually a small one but it's an important one which is what is sfu's president's salary um and this is one that i'm actually going to answer because it's pretty quick and i already have the info readily accessible um so it's pretty shocking we don't have this year's salary because the info hasn't been released yet but last year andrew petter the president of simon fraser university made four hundred thirty nine thousand nine hundred and ten dollars that includes an over thirty thousand dollar bonus and that does not include all of the expense costs for his travel and you know chatting with other fancy folks and just for context every person on the senior administration bracket so all of the vice presidents uh, they each made over $300,000.
So the folks that we're targeting, as Allison mentioned in the beginning, are these very, very well-paid senior administrators. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for because we don't want to keep everyone here for the whole night and you've already been extremely patient. Uh, so we're going to just move into the last 10 minutes to wrap up this town hall. So um, I think I'm going to throw it over to Allison for the C19 coalition to just wrap us up a little bit, talk about what the next steps are for the coalition and any next steps or things you want to share with participants. So Allison. Sure. So like we said, um, there was a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, there was even way, way more um, that people sent into us ahead of time um, and stories and things like that. Um, so uh, we will be posting um, like a post FAQ on our website um, and also a bit of a summary of some of the responses that we've given today. So people will be able to access those resources and have those questions as much as we can um, answered. Um, Afterwards, you'll also be able to still um, rewatch uh, the town hall and that'll be all uh, on our website. Um, and we'll also be passing these questions on to the administration and to um, the VP academics office so that they can also hear your concerns and hear um, what students are actually saying and what they are feeling um, and experiencing um, in a direct way. Uh, you can also go to our take action page, which has some petitions to sign. It has some um, example emails you can send to different administrators. Uh, we also are working with, or we began working with Migrant Students uh, United who have a petition that you can sign. Like Orion said, email John Driver about um, and express your support and your concern for your sessional instructors. Have your parents email John Driver. Um, and we'll be posting all of that information on our website and giving more uh, updates on our social media about uh, more updates, a bit about administration, what's going on and different things that you um, can do and can continue to be doing to help make, help democratically change, actually change this university. Awesome, thank you so much, Allison. Uh, before we wrap up for real here, do any of our other panelists want to offer some final words or next steps for you guys? Okay, I've got Osa. Yeah, just, you know, cognizant of the fact that we represent so many students, a lot of whom might be tuned in here. I just want to say, you know, keep an eye out for the different surveys that we put out, keep an eye out for the campaigns, the digital campaigns that we're doing. Um, please interact with us if something is going on, you know, if you're having issues with your instructors, if you're having issues, otherwise don't feel free to reach out to us, feel free to reach out to me, my email is president at sfss.ca, essentially we're just here on your behalf and we were elected by you and we're only here to essentially serve you, that's our job and <laughs> we're trying to do our best, but um, just know that we're here and that we want to support you in any way that we can um and that's about it for me and i hope that everyone is well and safe and we'll do our best to support you to be well and safe awesome great and we've got matt yeah a, a similar sentiment and i i just wanted to say that it's really important for regular students to get involved in big or small ways with the student unions uh, especially even if you're just telling us what your concerns are, what your problems are, because we might not have heard of it. You might be a special case or you might be one of many people and it's just more evidence that we need to take serious action on things. So, you know, please let us know what's going on. It's, it helps a lot. I know it helps me a lot, right? When I talking to administration and they're like, okay, where's the problem? And then I could say, well, I've heard from 30 people there's a problem, right? So, please get involved, you know, become a counselor if you're a grad student or join your caucus or your undergrad, the DSUs. There's lots of things you can do and they're all very helpful. But thanks everyone for listening. Awesome, thanks so much, Matt. And not to leave you out, Quentin, did you wanna throw anything in before we leave? Um, yeah, well, I mean, just a similar attitude to the other speakers. Um, I mean, thank you all for being here and thank you for having me here. Um, and I, would like to see uh, tuition freeze, and I'm sure tuition freeze now organizers would like to see us uh, going forward into the next year, continuing to push the administration um, for better transparency, consultation, and support for students, uh, and really making sure that students have a seat at the table. 
uh, when it comes to uh, their tuition that they're paying for to their education. Um, and I look forward to working with the C19 coalition that is happening here. Um, and if anybody is interested in organizing with us in the coming future, um, then please feel free to do so. Uh, you can find our Facebook page, SFU Tuition Freeze Now, and we're also on Twitter, I think just at Tuition Freeze, but that I'm not too sure about. But yeah, thank you. Great, and we have Allison for really actually final thoughts. Really, really, really short. Um, I wanted to add that this is also a form of action coming to this town hall and asking questions and participating in this and um, responding to the survey. That is a form of action that information is so important for you to give us that information. Um, the information is really important that you're hearing um, to stay informed to know what's going on um, to know how you can help. So um, I wanted to add that and to thank everyone for participating and to say that um, this is this is really important um, that you were that you all participated and um, asked questions um, and listened to what we had to say, um, and we'll hopefully maybe do more of these so people can continue that action. Thank you. All right. Okay, I think we're pretty much finishing off here, but uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that this was our first town hall, but it's not going to be our only one. So please be in touch with us on our social media and our website. Uh, it's pretty easy to remember. As we said, our website is sfuc19coalition.com, and it's pretty much the same thing on all of our social media handles, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, it is at sfu. C19 coalition. So please follow us, chat with us, come organize with us. We really want to meet you. We want to hear what you're going through and we want you to join us. Okay, I think that's all for me. I'm going to hand it over to Balkis to wrap it up. Um, I guess just reiterating the fact that we're in this together. Um, we, a lot of our struggles are connected and it's really up to us to organize to you know make sure we're working at like from different corners of campus to really towards the same goal um i want to thank the panelists so much for your time and um thank you ali for moderating with me as we navigate this whole tech thing um <laughs> during covid19 and yeah student power worker power we're we're united on this so thank you so much everybody um, please let us know what you thought of this mode of interaction. Um, there is a poll running at the moment. Um, just let us know your thoughts. And thank you, audience, so much for participating, for tuning in. Like, this is, yeah, like Ali, Ali said, it's, it's our first town hall, but not our last. So um, we look forward to staying in touch. And sign up, reminder, sign up if you want to actively organize with us. That's all I got for today. Thank you very much, everybody.